Hi, Helen. Long time no see. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Good. How are, how are you doing? Good, thank you. Though you're showing as Scott instead of... Uh... Oh, really? Yeah. Well, he did share his link with me, so there maybe that's go. why. Interesting. You know how to change your name, right, in Zoom? If you go to the partic open the participants panel and then hover over the more button next to your name, the drop down will give you the option to rename yourself. And it'll only do it in this call, but then you won't, people won't think you're Scott. <laughs> Not that thank you. Right. Thank you. Yeah, when I logged in, it called me Sochi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. It's good to see you, Helen. You too. Okay, good morning, everyone. Sometime, whenever you logged in last time on Zoom, it will, it will pick up that name from there, basically. So then you just need to change the name, basically rename it under participant. Very easy. Thank you. And if you use a link that was sent to somebody else, it'll often include that name. So there's all <laughs> okay, kinds okay. of reasons. Uh, okay, makes sense. That. That's good. Yeah. I just know a little bit one cent suggestion I just want to give to you if you want. Thank you for listening. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hey, Helen, when um, I click on my ch chat, it opens it as a separate window. How can I make it a part of the Zoom? They, they changed that. And I, I think, I don't know, somebody else may know. Because um, I had trouble because it, it attached it to the other stuff. And I did I wanted it to be separate. And now I can't remember how I did it. I think maybe wow. if you go to the, at the bottom of the chat window, you should see a horizontal menu with the three little dots. And in there, it'll say merge meeting window. That's it. It does. Yeah, that's it. That did it. That did it. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, everyone. Good morning. It is 10 a.m. Um, so I'm sure people will continue to come in. I am so happy to see everyone uh, here this morning. Uh, let me see. I'll, what do I do first? Let me share my recording, my my uh, screen first, and then I'll start recording. It was already recording, Sochi. Oh, it recorded. Is it really? It sure is. Thank you, Helen. Um, thanks. Uh, so welcome, everyone. Um, I am really excited to see everyone here. So many of you joining us. My name is Sochil Tirado. Um, I am a D coordinator at Imperial Valley College. Um, and I am also the, currently I'm the, also the CVC uh, faculty poker lead. Uh, so I've met a whole lot of you. And um, if I haven't met you yet, I'm sure uh, we'll meet uh, soon. Um, we do have a sign-in sheet. So I'm going to go ahead and drop that signing sign-in sheet into the link, onto uh, the chat, sorry, that sign-in sheet link into the chat. There we go. 
Um, so if you can, hopefully you have access to that. I, I tested it out and I made sure that you were able to get in there and edit it and add your name um, next to your college's name. Um, if, if anyone has trouble, I'm sure you'll let me know <laughs> with that site and sheet. Um, all right. Okay, so here is our agenda for today. Um, we have, um, as you can see, uh, some announcements. We have some colleges that are going to uh, talk about their poker process. Um, we're going to, we are, are, of course, are going to focus on the uh, CVC course design rubric. And then I'll end it with uh, just um, an overview of the local poker certification process, as well as uh, give you all some reminders. And uh, please mark your calendars for the upcoming uh, poker sessions uh, of this academic year. You will, of course, be getting an email with a link to register, but those are the dates that we have uh, mapped out for this academic year. All right, so the session is being recorded uh, automatically, <laughs> it sounds like. Um, so uh, the recordings are available on our poker site uh, that you can go and visit and see our past recordings. This recording will be up in a couple of days. Uh, please make sure to share this recording with anybody that wasn't able to attend. Um, and I just wanna take a minute right now, oh, I. No, no, I, I thought I saw a hand, but never mind. Um, no, no, it, I did. I did have a oh, hand up. If if we're not on the list that you shared, do we add our school or oh, is yes. that something that we want to, not, if you don't want us to do that to the list? No, Christine, please do add your school. And I do apologize if your school is not on the list. I may have... Um, by mistake, and I, I may have mistakenly deleted it. I was uh, working on the list uh, earlier today. Um, so I do apologize, but yeah, no, we're super new. We're super new to this. This is my first norming session. So oh, that's, okay, then yes. that's why we're not there yet. <laughs> yeah, then go ahead and add yourself to the list. And uh, that actually leads me to my, the next point I wanted to make. Um, I'm sure that there's some new people that are here uh, joining us today. So I want to take a few moments to remind everyone of the goal of the statewide norming sessions. Um, so when your college becomes a poker certified college, we do ask that each of your team members attend um, at least two of these norming sessions. Um, so don't forget to sign in and I'll drop in that sign in sheet in a little bit again, just so everybody has it. Um, uh, the sessions focus on poker, course design and the CVC OEI uh, rubric. Um, the sessions are meant to allow us to have a discussion about the success and the barriers that we face in course review in each of our colleges, because we're all doing the same thing. And I know that we're all, you know, we all have questions and face some um, sometimes uncertainties, but then, of course, a lot of success with going through that review process. Um, of most, as most of you are aware, uh, there have been some changes. Um, in poker and at one in in our and and with our team, uh, Dr. Ramini is here today, and I'm sure she's going to provide some details for us. Um, but I do want to emphasize that CVC is committed to supporting poker. Um, we're all aware of how important uh, the work that we have done is, and what we've accomplished, and we what we um, continue will continue to accomplish. Uh, so through this state, through these statewide norming sessions, I hope that we're all able to share our experiences and expertise because I know there's so many of us out there that do have, you know, a lot of expertise in the area of course design and review. Um, so, you know, um, I, and we want to make sure that we're sharing that to continue to improve the process in our colleges and to build better courses for our students because I know that that really is our goal um, as we do this work. Uh, so now I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over uh, to Dr. Marina Amini. 
Hi, everyone. You can go ahead and stop screen sharing. I actually don't have any slides to share. I want to just talk to the team and welcome you all to our first norming session of the academic year. And I also just want to acknowledge that, you know, the previous year was full of some like upheaval and anxiety around at one and renewing the grant. And if you attended our DE coordinators meeting recently, you'll be um, you'll, you'll I was happy to announce that we got a three year renewal with the chancellor's office. Our scope does include poker. Poker will be uh, maintained. We will continue to offer peer reviewer training um, throughout the contract, which is again, three years, and I'm expecting renewal after that as well. That's always what we advocate for. Um, and then also we're, the ones that are in progress, the colleges, and, and they're working on their local poker certification, we're going to continue to provide support on that. So Chitirado is doing a great job helping us in this transition, and she'll continue to kind of be your point of contact for all things poker. Um, and then also, you know, we are going to accept 10 new colleges. So if you have colleagues, uh, colleagues at other colleges that are really trying to launch their poker process, we'll be starting the process for 10 new colleges as well. So really excited to, you know, share that information with you if you haven't heard about it. We're also continuing to offer our at one courses and um, they are free of cost. Uh, they were free summer and fall and we should be rolling out spring uh, semester or spring term uh, courses as well. So really excited to continue serving all of you. Um, I also just wanna take this moment if you haven't met him already to uh, introduce you to Brandon Gaynor. He is a faculty member from De Anza College who is on reassigned time helping to lead um, at one during our transitional period. And then also, I just wanna acknowledge Helen and Cheryl who were a really critical part of the poker process and norming sessions and who helped to put a lot of the infrastructure together for poker, but who are now our esteemed colleagues at Foothill and De Anza Colleges as instructional designers there. So we're sorry to lose them, happy to have them as our colleagues in the district. And I just wanna take a moment to acknowledge them. So. I won't talk too much, but if you want to hear more, you can always um, pop into the DE coordinators meeting or ask your consortium representative for more details about the grant. Um, I'll be going over our scope in more detail during our next consortium meeting. So with that, I'll hand it back over to Sochi, and I look forward to a great program. Thank you so much, Dr. Amini. Thank you for being here and for that announcement. Um, I did see in the chat um, somebody ask if they are um, if they want to be poker lead listed as poker lead. Uh, what what should they do? Uh, just contact me. I will have my contact information on one of the the last slide. Uh, so you can contact me and with it, you can contact me about anything poker. So right now I am the uh, point of contact for anything poker related. Um, and I'm trying to get through my emails as quickly as possible. Um, I, you know, um, I'm constantly answering emails. So um, I, I get to them as soon as I can. Um, all right. So let me well, I really don't think I need to go back to sharing slides because I don't have a lot of information to share yet. Um, so we're going to go ahead and, and go on with um, our scheduled agenda. And uh, we're going to start with our spotlight colleges. And um, I haven't done a really good job of checking to see who's here. I did drop the um, sign in sheet back into the chat. So make sure you grab that and sign in. Uh, but is Angela here from Chile? Yes, I'm here. Oh, Angela. And I don't know I don't why know. I'm in here as Zochi Serrano, but I know. I don't know why either. That's so weird. Somebody else said that earlier that when they logged in, it was my name on the screen. So um I, I don't know, but you can change your I name. Can rename it, yeah. this earlier. I just noticed that. Um <laughs> so uh so Angela is here and there and now she's changed her name. Thank you, Angela. Yeah. Um, she is going to go ahead and talk to us about Shafi's process, um, Shafi's poker process. So I'll go ahead and hand it over to you. And if you need to share your screen, you're welcome to, Angela. Yeah, I'll go ahead and do that. Oh, it, it does say host disabled uh, oh. screen sharing. So let me see you. So I feel like it should work. Give me a second. Okay. Multiple person. Okay. Um, mm -mm. Is it lighting you now? Yes. Oh, great. All right. Everybody can see that. Okay, great. Thanks for having me. And I do want to give a shout out to Helen because she has been a huge help in this process. So thanks for all your help, Helen. And so too, thanks for your continued help too. Um, so uh, this is just, uh, I feel like we haven't really scaled poker yet, but I, we're, it's a slow rollout, but I did want to talk about our process because it's we've tried to make it really intentional. And I also want to talk about 
challenges and maybe um, see if there's any questions. So I'll go quickly. Um, all right. So this is who I am. I've been teaching online for a long time and I stepped into this role in a full-time way right in fall of 2019 and it was insane. Uh, so, but now I've survived and I have some hot tips for you. Uh, we'll see. So I just wanted to explain how we approached poker. Uh, everybody seems to do it a little bit differently. So I can talk about that a little bit and what we've learned. Identify potential ways to promote it and engage faculty. It's a he heavy lift for faculty. So that's been a big challenge, you know? Um, identifying potential ways to secure funding and support, that's really key. And then explain what's working and opportunities for improvement. So that's what we'll go over. Um, so we really invested in poker academies. Uh, we found that when we were, we just established local poker and we sent people off into the wild with a checklist, they were coming back with not really close to aligned courses. And that's what we really wanted, um, that they're in really good shape by the time our reviewers re received them. So we instituted these poker academies and what they are is their 12 hour uh, basically sessions where we go through the rubric with faculty. We get them paid at the seminar rate, which really is not that much. It's like a little bit more than they get for pay for working at Del Taco. And we do them five times a year. It's 25 um, faculty, no more than 25 faculty. And it's very hands-on. We take them through every section of the rubric. They practice applying it to their own course. And it's a kickstart to the poker process. And it really helps faculty understand what the rubric is, how to apply it, and kind of what the lift is too. So some people decide not to align. And we kind of determined as a group and with administrators here that there's no bad outcome. If people learn about the rubric and apply it to their course to whatever extent, that's a good outcome. Um, so, but a lot of people, it really has helped them. I see it also as sort of a deeper dive from our online teaching certification, which people do in a hurry when they're just trying to get assigned classes. This is a more intentional, slower um, process. It's very like mentorship based. And so I feel like the outcome's a little bit more um, useful too. So it's um, faculty do attend a one hour orientation that's an asynchronous course so that they understand what the rubric is, what the exchange is, what is this, you know, all of that stuff before that they sign up for it. Um, I did those monthly live and then I just created uh, an asynchronous course that they can run through that's interactive. Um, training materials are adapted from CBC course design resources, but we've added some local stuff too. So like little videos from um, our people who have aligned already that give tips. And the funding comes from various sources. So we her funds before grants, equity funds. I, my dean is very supportive. So they just kind of bring in money from different sources. Um, I will talk about data at the end of this, uh, which justifies the equity funding. So why are we doing these? We, um, like I said, we're running through um, online teaching certification quickly for some people because they're just trying to get assigned and I feel like it's a hustle. This provides in-depth, structured, compensated opportunity for mentorship and support in course design. Uh, it also introduces them to our support team. So we have DPS involved, our instructional technologists are involved, our DE coaches and our poker reviewers all co-facilitate these sessions. And so it gives them a sense of more support um, and familiarizes them with statewide initiatives. Uh, if everybody knows what CBC is, I'm pretty happy. Um, it also is a way to love to do basic accessibility training. Um, I have been teaching online for 17 years and I've been in a, some sort of a leadership role in DE for five years. The only DE training that's ever existed at my campus is what I created. And now I use poker, the rubric as an accessibility basics training. That's very um, troubling to me, but I think that it's a, it's a place to start as a basics and then we can go from there. Um, and then even if faculty don't ultimately align, there's no bad outcome. Um, so this is our faculty feedback. And I love this because 100% um, of people say that they gain new ideas, but one person says they're not going to apply them. So that is funny to me. <laughs> I want to know who that person is and find out that I'm hoping it was an accident. And then there's some nice comments that faculty um, had shared uh, in our survey. I really encourage you if you do something like this or any kind of... Um, poker related initiative to work with your research team if you have one and get data um, because that's helped us justify this going forward. Uh, and it's, we've gotten really uh, great data on both students and faculty. And I'll share the student one later. Um, so after Poker Academy, faculty work on their self-review checklist, which we've amended. Um, we incorporated section D and I know there's one statewide that has section D, but I found that the original checklist wasn't accessible. So I redid it. I'm happy to share any of this. Faculty are assigned two reviewers, one of whom elects to serve as a lead reviewer. 
And the instructional technologists do a final section D review, but we do have the faculty do an initial section D review. So we're training up our poker reviewers because we don't think it should be separate. Um, but our instructional technologists do have an extra level of um, expertise. And then once it's aligned, reviewers and faculty are all paid 500. I know that's not fair to the aligners, but that's what we that's what we're doing right now. And so we, we are open to changing that. And then those who have aligned are also asked to share their courses in the commons. So we're hoping to create a library of resources of aligned courses. And what does that look like in different disciplines? Um, one thing I love about the rubric is it allows for flexibility. So a lot of it, there, there's lots of different ways to do the same thing. So sometimes that's frustrating to faculty, but I think it's really great because it allows for that instructor choice. Um, all right, and then these are some considerations. So Poker Academy, I used to do it totally on Zoom. It was really insane. Like it was like four hours of Zoom for, for three Fridays. And it was just like a lot for everybody. So now I've made it more hybrid. And so there's it's ha uh, two hours of Zoom and then two hours of asynchronous activities. It's also allowing the faculty time to digest and apply. And then um, they come in in person for the last session for the accessibility one, um, because that's where a lot of faculty need a lot of support. And that way everyone's here in our center, They've got their computers out. We're working through stuff um, and together, and that's been really um, useful. Um, I don't know what happened with that second bullet point, but um, I think we may move to flex credit only uh, instead of payment. Right now, they can do pay or flex. Uh, there's a 12-hour flex requirement each year, so they could knock that out with just the Poker Academy. Um, for instructors to teach be beyond the contract requirements, they negotiated, so our negotiators and um, our uh, administrators negotiated that if you want to teach above and beyond the on, with the online, um, you know, I think it's like 40% of your contract, you have to finish Poker Academy. So now we have like people doing it, more people doing it because they want to do that. So that's been helpful. Um, and then incorporating institutional research has been central to ensuring institutional support. Um, so highly recommend that. Um, so 15% of our faculty have completed Poker Academy, but we only have 22 aligned courses and we have um, a thousand faculty. So like there, that is not that much, but I feel like we're making steady progress. Um, this is the data that shows the before and after of our aligned courses. It wasn't very many courses, but we did work with our team and it's really um, promising. So um, basically uh, they measured uh, the same faculty before and after they aligned to the poker rubric. And uh, you'll see that the success rates increased by 32% for black students and 24% for students ages 24, 25 to 29. And uh, for everybody, there's a 12% increase. And so this has been really fundamental. Happy to share the full re research report if anyone needs it, but this has been really fundamental to get institutional support. And also it's a great justification for equity funding. Um, this is really promising, I think. And then that's it. Questions. I'm quick. I'll stop sharing. Thanks so much, Angela. That was great. Um, yeah, we do have a few questions in the chat. Um, so I, I think a lot of it is uh, some of them are about funding. Um, so they're asking, Dr. Tracy asked, uh, they get the $25 an hour for 12 hours for training and then the $500 for aligning? Yeah. Okay. So that's um, like thousand dollars actually total, yeah. Oh, the other thing is I'm working on Title V. I got a Title V portion for DE and we're incentivizing some STEM courses. So because we found the STEM uh, instructors have kind of complex needs with accessibility um, and then there's online lab kit stuff going on, um, we've been able to incentivize them for higher. So I, any kind of grant you can find, you can usually plug into for poker. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, that's fine. And uh, I, I, Christine has her hand up, so I'll go ahead and have Christine. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh. Great uh, presentation. As I, I mentioned in the chat, that I'd seen the, the you know, the handout of data, uh, and it just blew my VP away. And he was like, "We got to do this." So uh, appreciate that. Um, it really, really helps seeing like, um, you know, to move the needle in in ways that we haven't been able to for certain groups is just unbelievable. I also love that, like, like the 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 um. Uh, you know, the movement wasn't so much for people like 35 to 39. And I'm like, maybe, maybe that's, maybe, maybe they have it all figured out. I don't know. <laughs> but um, uh, I just wanted to ask about 
uh, where to start. So we're, you know, we, we tried to do this a while ago and then the person who was running it took a job across the country. So it just fell apart. Um, and we have to do our like three, you know, capstone courses to start. Did you have a strategy about what you started with, where we should begin? Because right now, I mean, like the field is so wide open. It's almost like, I don't even know like who to talk to and who to, who to try to get as our first kind of like opening uh, game bit. So if you have any advice about that, I'd love to hear it. Well, we started with DE committee, then we moved to Senate and we got their support. Um, and then we didn't have any data or anything like that. I just had one administrator that believed, like thought we might have a good idea. And so, so once I had Senate and DE committee kind of, here's what's going on and they're backing them. Then we moved to that administrator and because the HERF funds are available, it was like, we did it this during the pandemic, which was in very intense. Um, and so what we did was we sort of got a, a, the reviewers trained, then we we prototyped it. And so we um, basically, I ran, I did my course um, and then I, we had, a, we practiced the review process. And then we, from that established, like, here's all the steps. And I'm happy to share any of this, by the way. Um, and then we, um, we, because we had that funding support, we were able to then kind of advertise it to faculty. We quickly realized that the, for us, the poker academy was necessary because people were just turning in kind of um, like not aligned, not even close to aligned courses, you know. And so then we were able to make the justification for poker academy and we run those five times a year. And that really um, it does. You know, a lot of people aren't like rushing to align classes after that. But I think they're they're like, oh, this is what the rubric is. They're, you know, applying it to their courses and slowly uh, making progress. So one thing I do want to work on is kind of um, now reaching out to those cohorts that have gone through and saying, you know, what do you need? How can we support you in moving forward? I did. I have tried to do lots of things like let's do a section A brown bag and nobody came. <laughs> that's, I guess that's not very appealing. But I think um, that's kind of where we're at right now is how do we move things, like expand, move things a little bit more quickly? What do people need? Um, but I just find, I don't know if you're finding this at your campuses, but everyone's just like, it's been exhausting since the pandemic. And so I think I'm happy people are still doing poker academies and we're still steadily aligning courses, but I still feel like they're not attending things as much. So, yeah. So I don't know if that helps, Christine, but I'm, I can share any of that stuff. Oh, it's, it's super helpful. I just, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you so much for sharing all of your yeah. uh, experience. Happy Thanks. to share. Dr. Ravini. Yeah, I just want to give a quick shout out again to um, Angela and Chafee for providing us with that study. I put in chat that I actually shared that with the chancellor's office when we applied for this um, contract and it helped us to make the case. Um, also, Wendy shared a great study from Pierce College about outcomes, and it was incredible. It showed like 22% improvement of success outcomes for black males. So I really, uh, if, if your college is doing you know, a study on poker outcomes, please, I beg of you, share a copy with us, send it on over. We use that for the chancellor's office to kind of continue support for what we do. Um, and then related to just you know funding for poker. So I was also a dean at my former college and I helped to launch poker and pay for it. It's always a challenge. You kind of need to get a little creative, but I always tell people take these equity studies to your college and ask for SEAP money, which is the Student Equity and Achievement Funds. I think that's a great fit. And then you kind of have to think outside the box, like chase categorical money. So I would go chase down an adult ed block grant to pay for adult ed classes. I would chase down strong workforce funds to pay for alignment of CTE classes. So you can actually find different pockets of money to pay for certain kinds of classes. Uh, and then, you know, your VPs are always telling me it's so expensive to pay for poker. What are your suggestions? I always also suggest prioritizing. So, uh, you know, when we first, first started poker, it was always about like, all right, what are the high need courses? Um, you know, I would like to pay for the eight person or the eight student CTE class, but it might make more sense to pay for the 45 student um, college math class instead, because that's a required course for transfer. So those are the kind of prioritizations that the college also needs to do that are really useful. So I, I love that Angela shared some of those discussions around funding and how to make everything fall together. I also want to share, we visited with Marina um, at Saddle, when she was at Saddleback, and they had these three concepts that really have convinced our faculty that it's compensated, it's voluntary, and it's confidential. So we include that in our orientation, and that was really a useful um, approach. So thanks, Marina. Yes, we have to talk to each other and support each other. <laughs> yes, uh, keep dropping your questions in the chat. I will get to them, but I do see somebody else has their hand raised, and they're so chill tirado, but I know they're not. <laughs> um, but whoever that person is, do you have a question? 
Uh, so it was just me. Yeah, I had my hand up, but you, I just wanted to make sure that the other questions by oh. Sarah and Jennifer didn't uh, fall off the chat, but you just mentioned yes. that you'd get to those. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Brandon. I, I don't know what happened with Zoom, you guys. Why is it? Why did it rename everybody? Anyhow. Um, yeah. So let me let me get to another chat question and then I'll get to uh, the next person that has their hand raised. Um, so it says, Angela, for part time faculty, can they also get flex credit? Yes, as long as they're on contract currently, then they can. Okay, and then are each uh, of the two reviewers paid $500? Do they get $500 each? Yes, and we also have some adjuncts that are reviewers that are kind of ahead of the the, the curve um, for their discipline. So, you know. And they do A through D? Yeah, they, well, that started this semester because oh. we didn't want to keep it separate. Yeah, sorry about my outlook popping off. Sorry. Oh, you're okay. fine. Ah, uh, okay. Let's see. Uh, what is your reassigned time as poker lead? I'm a I'm a full time DE coordinator, but I started off as a uh, eight hours. I was getting paid like eight hours a month, <laughs> on top of teaching six classes, and then I've just steadily advocated to, for twenty five percent, then fifty percent, then a hundred percent. So then, yeah. And after when the pandemic happened, now I moved into this. So yeah. Once I trained 800 people to teach online, then they were like, okay, you could do this. <laughs> uh, how long on average does it take your faculty to go from poker orientation to full alignment? There's really no average. I've had people do the, the academy and then they align in a month. And then I've had people align a year later. And so it's just all over the place. Um, and it, it really, I have found for the STEM faculty, it takes longer because of the accessibility piece. And that's because the, we didn't have any online classes in STEM before the pandemic. So that's why it's like that things weren't built for that. So there's a lot of remediation going on there um, and, and genuinely more complex needs in some cases. So, yeah, so that's why I'm trying to incentivize those areas too. Okay, and uh, then Ying, you have a question? Also, sorry, yeah. Julie says adjuncts don't need flex, but they do get payment. So if they want for Poker Academy. Yes, Ying, sorry. No worries. Um, thank you, Angela, for sharing. Um, we are always looking at TAFI's data because it's just really impressive. Um, I was wondering, so you and Marina both mentioned using the local C funding for poker. And I was wondering if your college is also integrating poker with the OER ZTC, uh, the campus OER ZTC movement. We do coordinate with them and we've done um, coordinated sessions together. Um, so we, it's not in the poker, it's not in the rubric, so we don't, but we we bring it into our training. So into Poker Academy, we mentioned how, how much easier it is for students to access. Uh, you know, with accessibility, we talk about more than just like the basics. We talk about UDL and we talk about equity and access. And so that plays into that section as well. Um, and that kind of is above what the kind of basic training is for that section D. So we bring it in that way um, and we've partnered on tra on trainings, but it's not um, an explicit focus of Poker Academy. Thank you. Um, and can I, I, ask I, just, I was going to just add the, the, the same thing, kind of similar. It's not the focus, but we do add, you know, we, we do provide support for it. Although some colleges really add a lot of stuff onto their poker. You know, I know like College of the Canyons also requires um, the course to be ZTC or OER and they have a bunch of requirements. So sometimes we would add that if, if I was using like a ZTC grant that had that requirement and the administrator for that grant wanted to use it for poker. So I would strike a deal with them and be like, all right. We'll tie this to the deliverables. Your faculty, if they're paid by this fund, will also need to make it OER. And so that that just became a part of our practices to check. But then I also at the at the end, I started putting that the faculty member had to at least like explore OER or, or look at it, you know, meet with a librarian. So I wasn't requiring it, but I would at least encourage them in this in the stipend deliverables to explore it. So for the title, thank you, Marina, for the title five, where I got a little extra funding to incentivize those, those are, we are partnering with OER and those courses have to be OER um, and poker aligned for them to receive that grant. And then they also have to be shared in the commons with our whole campus so that they can be a shared resource. So when I can, we're, we're requiring it. And then other times we're encouraging it because I just need people to poker align. Um, but that group is making huge headway. There's whole departments that are OER now, so. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Can I just ask a, ask a follow-up question with uh, Ashley Marina? Uh, from the last DE court, uh, DECO meeting, I think you mentioned that CBC is also doing similar research. 
um, on poker data, on collecting poker data. Um, is that is that true? It's um, so we are going to actually have to put together an analysis as part of our scope for this year to deliver to the chancellor's office. I don't know that they'll let us run a system wide poker study. I've tried to do that. We actually hired the RP group to help us with that. And then the chancellor's office kind of came back and said, you know, we, we think this is not quite in your scope. Let's wait on that. So we haven't been able to do a full on study, which is why it's really critical. If your college is running it, please share that with us. Thank you for that clarification. All right, any other questions for Angela? No? All right, Angela, thank you so very much for taking the time and uh, presenting this very valuable information. Um, I hear what you say when, you know, we do, like, at Imperial Valley College, we also have like our DE certification and they just go through right through it because they want to teach online. And there, there needs to be more. So I love the idea of like being like, okay, now like let's go back and and do a little, a little or a lot of fine tuning. Um, so thank you for sharing uh, what you guys are doing there. And um, if, as Dr. Amini mentioned, if anyone is doing uh, studies at their college, please share that data with us. I think that's so important uh, for for all of us to see because we've seen Shafi's data and it's. It's been wonderful. And somebody said in the chat, it helped them get funding at their college for poker. So uh, we can all help each other in that way. All right. So we're going to go ahead and continue on. Um, our next college is Ali Pierce. And I see Heather is here. Uh, so Heather, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you. And we are actually a perfect follow up to Shafi because we did use their initial study on success rates to do something similar at Pierce. Um, so my name is Heather Kokorowski, and I'm the poker lead at Pierce. I have 0.4 reassign time for poker lead, and then I also teach full time in the earth sciences. So I teach oceanography, geology, and environmental science. And um, we established poker at Pierce a few years ago and became a poker certified campus um, kind of early uh, in the process. So let me go ahead and share my screen. And Heather, just to let you know, you have plenty of time. Okay. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, okay, so I did title um, this little presentation, How to Expand Access to Quality Education with Poker, because of the initial data that we are coming out with that is showing um, this increase in student success after poker alignment. So I'll show you what we've come up with. Um, so my plan for my time here is to kind of go over what we're doing at Pierce. We've had a lot of success with aligning courses, um, and we do something similar that Angela was talking about with a, um, a poker academy. Uh, we have a poker prep course that is all in Canvas, all asynchronous, self-paced, and I'll show you a little bit about that as well. Um, so currently at Pierce, we have 34 quality reviewed classes from 19 different disciplines. And I've just put a list here just so you can get a sense of the type of courses we've aligned. Currently, we have over 20 classes in prep for potential poker submission this year. Not all of them will be ready for um, poker review but we've gotten all these faculty members started in the Pierce Poker prep course to get their classes ready. As Angela was saying with her program, not everyone will finish all the way to alignment, but getting faculty started really helps manage the expectations for um, how the review process will go. We have a team of 17 poker reviewers, plus two in training. Um, not all of them are available every term. So I just use a Google sheet to keep track of reviewer availability. It really helps to have this big team because as we know, we're all busy and um, people's availability changes. We typically have eight to 10 active reviewers each term. And then what I've started doing is after faculty go through poker and align their courses, we all know the ones that like really stand out and really have an eye for online course design. So then I'll reach out to them and, and see if they're interested in doing the training to become a poker reviewer. We don't currently offer funding for the reviewer training, but we do have funding with those equity funds um, to support the reviews themselves. And that, that 
uh, seems to be working pretty well so far. I will talk more about the equity funding um, shortly. So the preparation for faculty to participate in poker is, is key. And also garnering um, uh, excitement about the program. So in order to get faculty's attention and let them know about the program, at the beginning of every term, I'll send an email to all faculty. Um, we have aligned courses from all disciplines, um, credit and non-credit. Some have been one credit, three credits, five credits, lecture lab classes. Um, it's currently open to everyone. We also have a poker website that is just a Google site that has all of the information about poker. Um, so it's very nice to have a central location for all of that information. And I will show you that site shortly. And I've also been presenting to some of the committees on campus, the department chairs, to raise awareness about the program, and then they will follow up with their faculty and encourage them to participate. The next step um, is that I have faculty who are interested in participating. They send me an email, I create the master shell, and then I add them to that self-paced Pierce Poker prep course that I will show you shortly. Um, the Pierce Poker prep course um, requires about three to five hours of solid preparation for the poker process. As Angela was saying at Shafee, um, it's really important for faculty to know what they're getting into and to help um, increase the chances that they will have a successful review. So the prep course helps them get their class ready uh, for review by offering um, tutorial videos and webinars on the rubric itself so they know exactly what we will be looking for in the review and the quality of the courses that we've gotten, that we've accepted in for reviews have gone astronomically up. And faculty know a lot more about accessibility too because that's woven into the prep course as well. Um, and I did share the Pierce Poker Prep course on the Canvas Commons if you want to take it and adapt it for your own programs. And I'll share that direct link with you also shortly. And then as, as poker lead, I work with faculty as, they're, as they get their class ready, as they're working through the poker prep course. Um, and then, as I said, I use a Google Sheet to track reviewer availability and review status, making a list of all the classes that are in prep, who's ready, who's still working on it, just to keep track. So then the review process um, is once a faculty member thinks their class is ready, they've gone through the poker prep course. The last step of the prep course is to submit their completed course review prep form. And that means that they've gone through their own course looking for all the items that we'll be looking for. And they submit that to an assignment in the poker prep course. And then I will preview their class, sometimes giving them additional input. I'll get a pretty good sense if it's ready for review or if they need to keep working on it to potentially submit it the following term. Our review teams work in teams of two. Um, generally, they just divide and conquer however they are most comfortable. Um, you know, some reviewers might be more comfortable with section A, some with section B and C. Um, generally, everyone looks at accessibility since it's woven into the class. Um, and this is our, um, we also have a poker resources shell in Canvas that I use to communicate with reviewers themselves um, with resources for each rubric item in case they need a refresher. And then for the review itself, we use the Google Sheet um, course design tracker 2.0 that was created by Michael Robertson at Long Beach City College. He presented at one of our last poker sessions about that design tracker, and we adapted it for our needs and find it really helpful because it has direct links to each rubric item. And again, I'll show you what that looks like in a moment. So the review team completes their initial review. We aim for them to complete it within two to three weeks. And then they continue to work with the faculty to bring all items into alignment. And then the last step is for me to take a final look at all of the classes. Um, and this step has also been really important because we also this is kind of our internal norming, um, where as the poker lead, you know, I'm looking at everything and making sure our interpretation of the rubric items are consistent. Um, and also, again, looking at accessibility, which now is a lot easier because LACCD now has access to um, a course level accessibility checker called Pope Tech. Um, so we're encouraging faculty to start using that as well. And that's been really helpful. 
Okay, now the key, the funding, it all comes down to the funding. Um, you can't have a successful program if it's not supported. Um, initially, as many of you mentioned, we use professional development funds and the HERF funds, the COVID relief funds um, for a few years surrounding the pandemic. And now we are supported with Pierce equity funds because as the Shafee study showed, we know that poker supports equity. And we did our own study at Pierce mirroring the Shafee study um, where we looked at, at courses the semester before and the semester after poker alignment with the same instructor after COVID. So we made sure not to include data for spring 2020. Um, and we also found significant increases in student success, especially among black students. Um, overall, there was an increase in student success of 8.2% after a poker alignment with Asian, Black, Filipino, Hispanic, and multi-ethnic students as shown in our diagram here, and the greatest increase in success rates shown for Black students at 19%. And really, this is just a preliminary study. We only looked at six classes, but we were able to get in several hundred students before and after. So I think it may be on par with the Shafee study, but we were able to use this um, increase in success rates as an argument when applying for funding. And so that's how we were able to get funding through um, CPAC, which are, is the Pierce uh, Equity Funds. So now I'm going to switch over to highlight some of the resources that I mentioned. Um, how am I doing for time? About five minutes left. Okay. You're, you're good. You're good. Okay. So I mentioned, um, let me show you first just the Pierce Poker um, website. So this is a, a Google site. And this again was mirrored after the one that Michael Robertson at LBCC shared with us um, a couple sessions ago. And it's really helpful because when somebody's interested in poker, you can just send them a link to this website and they can see everything there is about poker. Um, you know, what is poker? How does poker work? What are the benefits? That's where we get into, you know, the increase in student success. How do I start? And then additional resources where I post the webinar recordings that are a part of the Pierce Poker prep course. So it's the prep course that I really am excited to show you because this, again, has just been fundamental in helping faculty get prepared for what's expected. Um, let me go ahead now and show you how you can access that. And then I'll show you the highlights. So if you go into the Canvas Commons and you just search for Pierce Poker Prep, you'll see that I shared the whole Pierce Poker Prep course, as well as the individual webinar, um, recorded webinars that I set up as graded video quizzes in the prep course. I don't think you can access the video quizzes, but you will be able to access the videos and then you can um, create your own quizzes. It's very hard to share video quizzes. So I'm just going to copy this link and then I will put that direct link into the chat. Um, there it is. Okay, I'm putting it into the chat now. And that should take you directly to this resource that you can download and then adapt however you would like to. It's always nice to have something to start with. Um, so let me just go back and show you the highlights of the, the prep course. So essentially, and this I've adapted this. So I've used this now for about a year and a half and I've scaffolded it so that participants go through each item step-by-step, step, just like I do in my classes to help everyone work their way through. In the, the, the module one is essentially like a little orientation. So I've set it so that they just have to view each page. And then we go down to this accessibility module they do this first. So originally, I was just telling faculty to watch this, the 10 day accessibility challenge created by Foothill College online, which is amazing. Um, but what I found from submitted classes later is that even though they should have watched those videos, some of the courses were coming in and the, the instructor didn't know about headings or about meaningful text for links or about how to do alt text. So then I realized, that this accessibility module needed a little bit more structure. Um, so that's where I went in and took each of those, you know, two minute 
um, video tutorials and turned them into a graded video quiz. And the quiz is not hard. It's like true or false. Did I just say this? True. Yes, you just said that. Do I need to use meaningful links? True, you need to use meaningful links. Um, but it's just to make sure that they're following along, watching them, and then understand what the expectations are. So they have to receive, the way I've said it, they have to receive two out of two points on each of these video quizzes um, to advance to the next item. So, and 35 minutes total for all of the tutorials. So those are all the short accessibility tutorials that really help set them up with a basic understanding of, of accessibility. Then we get into the big recorded webinars. And that's where I go through section A, section two, I broke section A up because as we know, it's pretty long. Section B and section C, again, set up as graded video quizzes. So they watch the video, answer questions as they go. And I not only just go through the, we use the course review prep form as they're um, working their way through the prep course, they fill out their own course review prep form. Um, but I also show examples from my classes on how they might uh, apply that rubric item to their classes. And the question earlier about how do you um, encourage OER or ZTC resources in poker, we also make sure to let them know how to embed those resources into their classes in a way that would um, be conducive to poker alignment, like not just providing a link, but embedding the resources into Canvas. So we also kind of include that as part of um, the preparation here. So then after watching those webinars and completing the graded video quizzes, I have it set so they need to receive at least eight out of 10 points. Then they advance to the assignment where they would submit their completed course review prep form. Um, along with this um, review ready checklist that is just part of the CBC OEI rubric. And that's most of what I wanted to show you. Um, just to show you real quick that the course design tracker that I mentioned uh, with the active links, again, was adapted from LBCC one. Um, and you can copy this as well. And the link to copy that if you want, I will also put into the chat and that will prompt you to make your own copy. And again, you can adapt it to your own needs. So let me go ahead and stop share. And then I can see all of you again. Um, what questions do we have? I don't see any questions in the chat so far. Um, anybody have any questions that you can unmute, raise your hand? Oh, Donna, I see. Um, hi. This is maybe a little off topic, but we've been noticing with a few of our um, course reviews, when they're using some OER and they're embedding it, we're finding some accessibility challenges with the OER. And that's that's difficult because I don't want faculty to have to remediate things that they did not create. It's hard enough to get them to remediate things they did create. So um, is anybody else experiencing that? And what do you do? Well, we've been telling them just link out, but that really doesn't fix it. So just curious. Yeah, I'll take that one first, to just share our experience. Um, so we do require that they remediate anything that they use in their class. Linking out is not um, ideal as we know, right? Because we want to embed as much as possible into Canvas. So what we do and what actually has worked out really well um, is you can you can copy and paste the text into Canvas pages, but then you do have to make sure the headings come through. Sometimes there are typos in those OER resources too. Those need to be fixed. And then also sometimes the alt text with images does come through as well. Sometimes it doesn't. So again, that has to be checked. So what we encourage faculty to do, number one, is to copy and paste it and then fix anything that needs fixing. Another trick is to use an iframe. The HTML code for an iframe is on a Canvas page. You can actually bring in that external link to, for example, LibreText or OpenStax so that it will embed that external content onto the page. And then you can provide instructions. That's the embedding part where you say, you know, complete the reading below as you read, keep these. Um, these points in mind, providing that context that's required. And then you just link out to um, 
to the resource. And that's in those pages that you saw in the Pierce Poker Prep course, Embedding Course Content. Um, and I can share the HTML for that iframe if you'd like, um, but that's the way we, we've been handling it. Angela, do you want to chime in with your, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to add, that's always, um, you know, a snag because we didn't have, it's not been a priority at our institution to train faculty for accessibility. Um, but we, one um, thing I can share is we had um, a math faculty that uh, had aligned her entire course and they had used this a free textbook that they created for um, in-person instruction. And so the entire thing was not electronic. And it, the lift to make that accessible was so burdensome that it was gonna prevent her from aligning and she already had done A through C. And so I was able to make the case to um, my administrator that this would be something worth funding um, to, to support. So she got remediation support for that and cons consultation. So she did a lot of it herself. And then she also got remediation support. And then as long as she shared it with the entire department, we were able to support that because she had already done A through C and she wasn't going to be able to align. Like it was going to be an insane amount of hours. And so that's some, a strategy too. So when what we expect faculty to do is to remediate for the basics, the 90% of what they're going to encounter. And if there is something that's just so burdensome, they wouldn't be able to do it otherwise. Then I just try to find money um, all over the place. And then um, usually I can so far, but it's very like, <laughs> it's yeah, very hit and miss. But as long as they share it as a resource for the college, um, I think that is a really good um, sell for the um, administrators. All right. Thank you. Uh uh, Colleen. Uh, thank you. Yes. And my question kind of hits a little bit with what Angela was just talking about. When um, I was one of the leads for course review uh, during the past couple of years, one of the issues we ran into was precisely that burden of making content accessible, ADA accessible. And sometimes, and I've gone through all the ADA training, but sometimes I'd come across something I go, I don't know how to you know finish this off and make it totally accessible and I'm wondering if any uh, college has managed to get a um, support from their DSPS or ADA specialists who I know are also dealing with student issues with accessibility and helping students navigate through that but getting kind of that permanent position or role from that DSPS department such that they would be available to faculty going through the course of review process that could help them over that hurdle with accessibility. I can speak to that. Um, I am part of a, our student accessibilities department. I'm also a 17 year faculty at the community college. So hi, and I've been a poker reviewer that uh, focuses primarily on accessibility for about seven years. And my position is alternative media and assistive technology specialist at uh, my full-time job. And what we do, we don't have a poker review committee here, but they're trying to start one up. But to get to your question, um, I do help instructors who have severe remediation issues, uh, such as captioning a video that's very, very long, um, remediating documents, but I want to say carefully that um, really the bottom line is if the, if instructors don't know how to create from scratch, from the beginning of the process, how to create those headings early on, how to create uh, and import, you know, content that is actually going to be read by a screen reader correctly and so forth in Word, PowerPoint, whatever, and then when they save it to a PDF, it's kind of a nightmare. It's almost easier to start from scratch, whether it's me doing it. I mean, obviously it's it's less burdensome for me to do it, but my time here is spent doing many other things. So it it's tough. I will help them to a certain degree, but um, it, if it's just like something that's gonna take many hours and many, many hours, it's, something they have to start from scratch again. And it's unfortunate I can train them on how to do that, but I can't uh, take all my days away doing that for an instructor. So it's tough. I'm not, I'm not giving funding to do that either. I wish I was. <laughs> they should have a full-time person. I'm always thinking to myself, 
it would be lovely, but um, schools haven't gotten to that maturity yet with accessibility needs. And I think that's something that needs to be looked at in the future and argued for. Um, I'd love to hear others' opinions on that. Thanks, Suzanne. I think we all agree. Uh, do you want to go ahead and ask your question since you had your hand up? Oh, that was me responding and saying oh, okay I thought you had maybe you had another question all right no thank, thank you, you. No, thank I'll you put my so hand much. down <laughs> thank you uh Deborah um thanks um I don't ha necessarily have a question as much as I have a comment to make about the cut and paste other things into the canvas shell um for one you get a lot of code that you don't want and two the attributions and and those kinds of things do not necessarily copy over because they may not be part of the actual thing you're cutting and pasting. And I really worry about that because you can't post things without attributions, especially um, photos, who the writer of the text was, things like that. And third, uh, LibreText is a great platform because everything is accessible before you can even launch it. And um, I've... I have five books up there and we've never had any problems with accessibility. And now they're putting up uh, test banks and ancillaries and things like that to go with all these classes. So anyway, those are just my statements. Thanks, Deborah. I we appreciate that. Can I chime in real quick just to um, clarify? So I mentioned that iframe code for embedding the OER content and I saw in the chat yeah, give us the give us the code. Um, that code is actually in the Pierce Poker Prep course. So wanted to make sure that you you do have access to that. Um, I think it would if I just put it in the chat it might be confusing. But in the Pierce Poker Prep course that's on the Commons, if you go to those um, items that I showed you, that embedding OER content page shows the iframe. Um, but let me know if you don't find it, and I can put it up separately. Thanks, Heather. And I do see questions on the chat. I will get to them. Uh, Dr. Amini? Yeah, I just want to kind of chime in about accessibility. So um, when I was at Saddleback, this was really a recurring concern as well, because our faculty just felt like they didn't sometimes have the tools or the ability to support the courses of their colleagues in the way that those faculty needed the help. And so we actually portioned it out so that, you know, Section D did go to our instructional technologist. And then that's another piece as well. So if you have an instructional technologist, right, if you come from a tiny college, you don't even have that. But if you do, not all instructional technologists have the background in accessibility. So, you know, I, I supervise, we had three at Saddleback, which was really a huge blessing. But um, I, I then made sure that my instructional technologists got training. So I would like pay for them to go take classes and training and get the information they needed. Um, eventually Saddleback, after I left, has hired an accessibility person who is a technologist who can just help with accessibility for faculty, not students. Um, but that took gosh, like four years. And I'm seeing comments in chat that said, oh, we've, we've been prioritizing it. We didn't get funded. We didn't get hired. You have to keep pushing for that and really justifying it because really, you know, one lawsuit from a student will be a lot more expensive than hiring a technologist for the next five years at the college. And um, you kind of need a, a team of administrators, researchers, and faculty to push for that and, and make it happen. Good point. Thank you. Um, okay. I do have uh, some questions in the chat. Um, for Heather, do you know how long on average it takes people to complete the poker prep course? And did most of the people already take a design course of some kind like OTD? Um, what is OTD? Uh, online teaching and design, the at one course. Oh, yeah. So to to be eligible for poker, they the instructors have to be already DE certified. So they will have already taken the introductory to Canvas courses. Um, the time, uh, I think if you just include how long it takes to watch the webinars, it's like two to three hours. So I, I tell them three to five hours. Um, and I was trying to ask them like, how long did it actually take you? Cause they might want to watch parts more than once. So the expectation is, you know, three to five hours, but it's not expected that they're going to sit down and do it all at once. They're working on their class, you know, and getting it ready and completing the course review prep form as they go through it. So I generally um, get people started at the beginning of the semester, and then they have about five or six weeks to go through the course and get their class ready. And then I see which classes are most ready for review. 
And then depending on how much funding we have, I take how, however many classes we can support, also dependent on reviewer availability and put them through the review and then keep everybody else working on whatever needs attention in their class. So it's three to five hours, but it's not really just three to five hours because they're working on their course at the same time. Thank you. Um, do you ask them to remediate non-accessible or for not for for-profit publisher resources as well? If they're going to use publisher resources, they need to be accessible. Um, it's not our job to do that. It's the publisher's job, but we can't use it if it's not accessible. Um, so they need to put pressure on the publisher to remediate it um, or to something else. So if they know that their publisher material is not accessible, they should not be using it. Okay. I'm going down, seeing if I see an IT question. I'll ask that right now because I think that one's a little bit more general. Um, I think that's all. I'm sorry, I, I was way up on the chat because I didn't want to lose my place. <laughs> um, okay, there is a question about um, IT and Google. If that person doesn't mind unmuting, because I have to look for the, I have to look for the question again, and the chat is getting really long, which is good. Um, yeah, that that was my question. So, you, at at our college, we're uh, a Microsoft college, and and within our DE committee, we use SharePoint, and a lot of documentation lives um, within Microsoft and whatnot. But we've really enjoyed the sharing that has occurred in this forum for uh, tracking documents and think Google works particularly well for that, but we're seeing a little pushback um, on, on RIT saying it's not supported and then whether administrators want us to not use it um, because IT says it's not supported. So I was just wondering if anybody's coming to that type of issue with the Google Doc uh, version of their tracking things. Anyone like to comment on that? I'm sure you're not alone, Cynthia, in that, uh, with that issue. We've had a problem with um, liquid, we recommend liquid syllabi, and then the Google sites um, don't work for certain students. And the, the IT has told us because it's Google's not supported. So we recommend a backup syllabus that's just basic, but um, I just don't. I mean, Google is a normal thing to use, so I don't really, if we, we want to use it internally, we just use it, um, but I'm sure that's not preferred. So, yeah. Thanks, Angela. And Russell? Yeah, we have the same thing in LA Trade Tech, where we're being told that everything is migrating to SharePoint and um, 365. So those are the only instances that will be supported by IT. Yeah, and I will share at um, Imperial Valley College, we also have the same sort of struggle right now. We're a Microsoft school. Uh, somebody turned Google on a few years ago, didn't manage it, and IT has now turned it off. So uh, we're we're still, still finding solutions for that, but it, it does become very difficult when um, a lot of um, documentation is coming to us, especially as leads through uh, Google Docs. So um, I share your everyone's frustration with that. Um, uh, and Angela, somebody would like to know, um, how have you gotten your admin to allow liquid syllabi? Well, we have to submit a document syllabus to the Dean, you know? Um, so we just recommend that they, it's a best practice and we recommend it as like a humanizing aspect. Um, and then we always just say, create a backup basic PDF for those that can't access the Google site and and for your administrator. And it's annoying the first time, but it's really easy to update. So that's what we do. And I don't, yeah, I don't feel like our administrators, I don't know if that they would have the power to stop that, <laughs> but maybe they do. I don't know. We haven't really run into that problem. So IT doesn't like it is really all we're, we're seeing. Thanks, Angela. Um, and then uh, Kate has a, a, a question about accessibility and the weight of like, is like when you have different accessibility issues, do some issues weigh heavier than other issues? Uh, Kate is asking, and I don't know, Kate, if you want to unmute yourself and talk a little bit more about that. Hi, sure. Um, 
Yeah, it just seemed that when I would have a question and I would maybe refer it to another faculty member who had more experience with revealing and I'd say, you know, if I'm running the wave tool on a website or something and um, this person said, well, you know, if it were a header issue, I would say definitely don't use it, right? Um, but it, if it looks like these are more minor issues, um, so that's one thing is, it, and so maybe she could just put a disclaimer in Canvas saying, if you have trouble accessing this, reach out. Um, and that's, so it's actually a few questions. One is like, how do you feel about disclaimers? You know, <laughs> if the if the third party website, for example, isn't a hundred percent accessible. The other question is, are some issues given more weight and some you could kind of get away with? And the other thing is like, for example, when you run the um, wave tool, you know, there are alerts that come up uh, and then there's, you know, there's the red and then there's like the alert. No, the alert is the, the serious one, right? But then there's one, some that are just like, hmm, not good. <laughs> I don't remember what they call it. So sorry, that's like a lot of questions. You can weigh in on any of them if you want. <laughs> that's okay, Kate. And you know what? I, what I am going to do, Helen, I hate to put you on the spot, but I'm going to put you on the spot because Helen is very knowledgeable with accessibility. Can you provide some clarity for us, uh, some guidance, please? Well, I'll talk and Cheryl can chime in too, or Sean. It, it, if it's in a course, it should be accessible. That'll protect the instructor from the law. Given that, every college may have their own guidelines, but in terms of external websites or publisher content, it still really needs to be accessible. So in terms of publisher content, you're going to want to be hounding your reps en masse and telling them, we need you to make this content accessible because we don't want to have 100 of our instructors individually remediating the same ding dang thing for external webs and there is power in numbers for external websites one possible rule of of guidance is the aspect of the website that you are having students use needs to be accessible so if you are for example sending students to read an article on a website and the website has proper lists, heading structure, things that will make it readable. But the site itself maybe is messy elsewhere. You would need to worry about that messy part because you're not asking students to interact with that messy part. Hopefully I said that in a way that makes sense. Um, otherwise, the disclaimer part, one issue with that is is the instructor prepared with some other alternative for the student so that the student doesn't lose time being able to get whatever information they need and submit whatever, you know, do whatever tasks they're being asked to do with that content. Um, so if the instructor is going to provide a disclaimer saying, get in touch with me, they need to first make sure they have some alternative content or activity or what it is that will be accessible so that the student isn't able to keep up the pace with everybody else. Again, hopefully I said that in a way that made sense. And if that didn't address what you were asking, and now I forgot who was asking, please um, say so. Cheryl, anything to add? Well, I was just going to add that we have to keep in mind uh, we probably wouldn't be using any part of the internet if it had to be 100% accessible, right? What Helen said is so true. You have to be specific to what you're sending. But also the preparation is really important in the creation of the course. So it's not just a disclaimer. It is a partnership with somebody at DSPS or you. You know, when it's inherently inaccessible and you have to have some sort of plan put in place, that's, I think, should be upfronted if that's a word, um, in the course materials that not just, you know, if you have trouble with this site, no, it has to be a little bit more in tune with your DSPS or what accommodation they could make. And, uh, you know, you've heard it from us from, for years about the actual curating of the materials and the why. And I think a lot of you that we've worked with put that into the training. 
Why are you using this material? What's so important? Well, it's my best video and I just love it. Yeah, but it's not accessible. So, you know, and it's about the conversations that you do have and the mentoring that you have with the, with the faculty. Thank you. Thank you both, uh, Helen and Cheryl. And uh, I'm going to um, continue us on, but not before I thank Heather for um, presenting and sharing all of that great, uh, all those great resources and your process with us. I think that's very helpful for so very many of us. And thank you for the conversation. And I am going to move us on. We can talk about accessibility for the rest of the time. I know we can because there's so many uh, questions, uh, doubts, concerns. Um, and, you know, um, I guess I the one of a silver lining is it seems like we're all kind of struggling with this, but we're continuing to to work through it and um, and, you know, become more familiar and, and become a. Uh, um, experts in dealing with accessibility. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and move on uh, and uh, to our next portion uh, of this session. And we're going to just talk about norming and we're going to talk about uh, the CVC OEI rubric. And to do that, uh, we have Donna here from College of the Desert. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you, Donna, um, so you can go ahead and, and lead us through this. Thanks, Sochi. Um, and sorry for opening that can of worms. <laughs> I think it was my question that kind of <laughs> hit it. I'm sorry, the presentation was excellent. It really was. Um, so Sochi asked if we could talk a little bit today about what we do for student services at College of the Desert. Um, and so just for a little quick background, we have a pretty stringent initial certification for faculty. So they go, we do the 12 week OTD, online teaching and design, then they have to create a capstone and the capstone course is reviewed. It only has to contain four modules, um, but they have to get that reviewed and it has to be fully aligned with the OEI rubric in order for them to get badged to teach. And they have to recertify every five years. So um, we, we kind of build in on the upfront. They're, kind of, they're closer to being ready to get poker certified, but doing those reviews really helps us see where we're missing the ball on what we're training them to do. And we noticed a couple places in the section A student services that we thought we could fix. So I will go ahead and share our PowerPoint. Everybody does PowerPoints, right? <laughs> and share the um, pieces of the rubric of section A where we have um, made some changes and fixed things up in what we do. So um, talked about that. We also, in addition to using the OTD, which we have adopted and made, um, made for our courses a little bit more um, streamlined, we also create a sandbox template for their initial certification course. So they, their first instruction is to create a sandbox and import our sandbox template. So we start them off with that template. And um, we found out what some of the things that we knew we needed to fix. So A11, um, learner feedback. We noticed that in the OTD, um, there really isn't an assignment to create that survey. And what we found was they were not adding it in. So they were turning in their core shells and it was missing A11. Almost everyone we looked at we were like, oh, well, shoot, we got to fix that. So um, we also, when we talked about it, we felt that an end of course survey, while important, doesn't allow the faculty member to then respond back to the students. Well, thank you for sharing your feedback. Here's what I'm going to do to fix it. So we added a mid course survey to the OTD. And we then provide feedback to the, 
the instructors who are taking the course and show them that this is a good model to do so that your students feel like they're being heard in the middle of the class. And um, let me go ahead and open that up. So I've sent a link to it here. So this is, we've got a mid-course survey. We use SurveyMonkey and we tell them that you can create a free SurveyMonkey account, use up to 10 questions and use it over and over. We also have a Poll Everywhere account at COD, so we share that with them. And we also then tell them we've got, my, we're Office 365 too, like everybody else. So we tell them Microsoft Forms is also a great way to gather that information. And we tell them however you choose to do that, make sure you tell the students, thank you for sharing and here's my response to what you've told me is working well for you and what you've told me, maybe you need to improve. Because um, we just feel like in a 16 week course, if you're only asking them at the very end how things went, you're gonna lose students and you might not know why. Um, so A12 is just pretty simple, right? It's there or it's not. So we, we looked at A13 for student services. Um, so one of the things we did, because we wanted to be sure that not just faculty, um, or not just students, but faculty were aware of the resources we provide. Often, especially adjunct faculty, are not taught how to find those services and where they are. So we created a student resource module that includes um, four categories of help. So we have administrative links, academic assistance, counseling, and health and wellness. And so in addition to having that module, which we've shared in comments here, um, we then have faculty linking back throughout their course to these resources. So that module exists in our sandbox. It's already in there for them. We update it every semester to make sure that the information and the links are current and accurate. Um, but we have technology help and tips. Our, we have a LibGuide for virtual learning. And then we have just links to all of the other resources that are available on campus for students. And then Instead of just having them there, we also make sure that faculty are linking to them when they feel students need them. So we're making sure that they're um, doing things like providing extra credit for using the online tutoring resources. We don't tell them they have to, but we suggest it, we recommend it. Um, make sure that they're sharing campus events, right? Keep those online students feeling like they're part of the college because that's one of the things that we find. Students tend to, on online classes, they tend to feel disconnected from campus. And as the DE coordinator, whenever, whenever I'm in a meeting and they're talking about some kind of an event, I always say, so what part of that is gonna be for the online students? How are you sharing that with online students if they're doing a listening session? I'm like, so you got some virtual sessions, right? When are those? Make sure we're sharing that. And then tech support has been one of those things that I feel is really lacking for our students. We don't have somebody who's devoted just to helping our students. Um, I've lobbied for it. It's included in my prioritization every year, um, but that's definitely, it definitely falls down through the cracks. So we made sure that in that or student support module, we have a special page that has our student services, right? It links out to Canvas support and we have a Canvas orientation, student orientation, so that we can bring them back to that. Um, in fact, let me go ahead and open that page for you. So the technology help and tips page is available in their orientation module 
and we include it in that student support module as well. So it has like a little short intro video, welcome to the college. And then we provide them with the student portal link where they can reset their password or who to email if they get stuck. Um, because they, we don't have one person. So, and then of course the student guides. And this is our team right now. Um, one instructional support specialist who is there for faculty. Um, our technical support specialist, we share with the library. So we get him a little bit of the time. And then Christina, Elizabeth and myself are DE coordinators. I'm the full timer. And then Christina and Elizabeth are both part-time. So, but we're all here really to support faculty. So I see that student support piece is so important that we build it into the sandbox, into what we're making sure people are doing. So that's our student support. All right, thank you so much, Donna. Um, uh, Helen does have a question, uh, and I think this is about the survey. So she says, Donna, is it acceptable for the instructor to send an announcement after the midterm survey, summarizing the student input and how the instructor will respond? Or do you ask for an individual reply to each student? Um, I Exactly that, an announcement with kind of a summary because it's an anonymous survey. So. Okay, just making sure that, thanks. Yeah, no, it's an anonymous survey and we really highly encourage that because otherwise the students are like, well, sure, I took the survey, but nobody listens. Nobody reads those things. So making sure that you provide a summary. Um, in fact, I know, I remember one time I had a eight week course and in the mid course survey, several students complained that there was too much work. So I shared with them a reminder that in a 16 week course, you're expected to work three to six hours minimum in an online class. So now if we're condensing that, so just reminding them that this is a short term course. And I know it's a lot of work, but you're doing double work. So it's helpful that they just know they're being heard, I think is really important. Yeah, good point. And uh, somebody is asking for, um, uh, Jennifer asked if the survey is not anonymous, uh, are they he hesitant to give feedback? Um, and then and then they asked about providing, uh, Jennifer asked about providing points for completion of the survey. But as far as I understand, this survey is supposed to be anonymous for it to meet the criteria of um, that part of the rubric. Um, yes. So yeah, and uh, Points for completion, though, Donna, in the case of what you're sharing, do you guys provide any points for completion or is it just um, voluntary? So in when we're doing it in the online OTD course, no, there's no points for completion. It's, it's optional and it's really there as a model. Um, but in a course that somebody's teaching, we encourage them to provide some points. Tell them it's anonymous, so... One of the things that I'll do in an anonymous survey is I'll have students come back and just say done and they get their points. It's a kind of an honor system. Um, so a few points usually encourages students to do it. I, I would agree with that, but it is anonymous. So you wanna make sure it's anonymous. So when it's linked to an assignment, sometimes they feel like, oh, they say it's anonymous, but really that's why we don't use the survey tool. And new quizzes is going to get rid of that anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Another totally different conversation. Uh, Helen did drop an a, uh, a resource for A11, uh, but then there's some comments that it's not in comments, but so we'll we'll have to take a look and, and see. It's if we not can in comments. That. It's in the course design resources shell. Oh. And that's the link that I, I know so exactly. Of course, 837 in the CCC instance of 
Canvas, that's the course design resources and A11 has the example. Yes, thank you. Yes. So if you're not familiar with uh, the course um, that Helen is talking about, take a look at the chat. She dropped that link in. Uh, that course, uh, had, it, it's, uh, it's always on my uh, bookmarks. And um, I think a lot of us reviewers refer to it because it explains each part of the rubric. It gives uh, examples and then there's help for reviewers as well. Uh, so that's what Helen is talking about. And there are some example surveys uh, for A11 in that course. So take a look. Um, any other questions for Donna um, about these parts of the rubric or any other comments from anyone about these parts of the rubric. Donna, I, I am wondering if, um, because you have that template, um, obviously you provide that to faculty, it's, it's, it's not required for them to use that template? It's not required, but when they don't use it, they do not pass their certification easily okay <laughs> we tell them just use it your, your certification is going to be so much easier and faster and since we've updated our template um our reviewers have said over and over the courses look so much better they're okay. going through quickly they're they're aligned so it's definitely worthwhile that's great. Thank you. And one of the challenges I'll tell you I face, because I do have a template myself for the, the with all the student services. And, you know, it hits on a lot of the pieces of the rubric that if they just use it, like they're going to be aligned in those areas. Uh, but, you know, when there's revisions done to that template, I send emails and I let them know. And time and time again, I'm sure it happens to uh, not just me, but a whole lot of you. Um, I go into a course for whatever reason, and then they still have the old information with the old template. And I see Mar Maria Elena's face. And <laughs> so I'm not alone in that. Oh, it's so frustrating. But, you know, we do what we can. Um, all right. So I think that's all the questions we have. Uh, Donna, thank you so very much for uh, providing that information to us. Um, I think, again, just some very good ideas for everyone to uh, hopefully, you know, adopt and, and, you know, make them your own for what works for your college. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and continue on. And actually, I do need my PowerPoint now. So let me get myself settled here. Do that. All right, I think you all should be able to see that. Um, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and just very briefly, I'm just going to show you some data. So I have um, our regular CVC exchange data. I know that this is poker. You know, we're not talking about the exchange, but I think it is exciting to look at these numbers. Um, and you may have seen them in other meetings. Dr. Amini uh, goes around to different uh, areas sharing this information. So uh, even though, you know, um, we're not talking about exchange. Poker is a part of the exchange. And uh, one of the reasons why, you know, the, the rubric was designed and going through this process is so important. So I just wanted to share that with you. Uh, but something that maybe uh, resonates stronger with, uh, with us here in this meeting is our poker data. So currently, I went through the numbers and we have 68 local poker certified colleges um, we're doing really well. And right now I have 12 colleges that are in progress for poker certification. And I just want to clarify uh, that number 12. So I do have eight colleges mm -hmm. that are continuing on um, their oh, process. My is right now I'm trying to focus on something, but it's Okay, sorry about that. Um, I have eight colleges that are continuing the process from the spring that I am working with to get them through. So they're uh, most of them about more than halfway through. Um, and then I have four brand new colleges that just started uh, just this week or last week. 
Um, Dr. Ramini mentioned that uh, for this fall semester, we are gonna um, accept 10 colleges to start the process. So I still have space for six colleges. And uh, we're just doing 10 colleges right now, just because of the change in the team. And um, I'm the only person right now that's taking care of poker. So that does get challenging, you know, to find the time and things like that. Uh, but so far it's worked out fine. Uh, but we're we're well on our way to, you know, adding more uh, colleges that are local poker certified. Uh, so I am going to talk about walk you through the certification process for poker. So those of you who are here that are already certified, please don't leave. You can tune me out for a little bit. But um, I do have some closing remarks as we get closer to the end of our session that I would love everybody to hear. Um, but if you're curious, uh, here's the information. And if you're new, I think this information will be really helpful to you. Um, so our poker certification process changed about a year ago. Um, we redesigned it with the, uh, with the help of uh, Cheryl, Sean, and Helen. Um, this is the model that we have and will continue to use moving forward. Um, I think it's worked really well. Uh, for colleges that have gone through this process. Uh, but here is here it is kind of in a nutshell. Um, you can find a lot more detail in our poker uh, resource site, uh, but I'll just walk you through it. And if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat and I should open that up so I can have it uh, available to me. Um, okay, so before you begin, um, with poker certification, there's some things that you want to make sure that your college has in place. So first, you want to assemble um, a poker team. So your reviewers, you want to get your reviewers together and you want to get them poker trained. Uh, we have the poker courses that are available this semester. We'll have more next semester. So you want to make sure that they get that poker training. Um, then you want to make sure that you've established um, a local instructor pre preparation process. Um, I can't um, state how, or I can't emphasize how important uh, this number two is. Um, as you saw today with our presentations, getting our faculty, our instructors prepared makes for an easier review process. So having a um, a robust um, preparation process will help the outcome of your review. Um, I think everybody that's doing reviews that's gone through poker will agree with that. Um, after you have those two things in place, um, you have a process, you have a team, um, you have a review process, um, then you can submit the local poker certification application that's found on our site. Um, that it's just a questionnaire asking you like who's the lead, um, what's your process, who's on your team, you know, just general information like that. And after you submit that certification, you will send me an email. Uh, contact me. Once you contact me, then I will. Um, you know, get in touch with you and then we'll uh, plan on meeting to talk more. Um, so this is, these are the things that you have to do before you begin. I know I, it looks really simple. Uh, different colleges require different things, academic senate. Uh, there's the whole um, pay uh, money situation. Uh, some colleges, you know, you have to talk to your union, things like that. So, um, you know, it's not, it's not as, as easy and direct as, as we all hope it would be. Um, all right, so any questions so far? Um, okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and continue. Um, but if you have questions, feel free to drop them in the chat or raise your hand and unmute yourself, that's perfectly fine. So once you, once you submit that application, contact me, I contact you, uh, we will set up a meeting to talk some more. Um, and then the, the capstone process begins. And this is, again, in a nutshell, what happens. So we schedule our initial meeting. Um, I'll meet with the lead and the team, uh, whoever's available, to discuss the process, establish a timeline, 
Uh, talk about any details that the college uh, needs to know, clarify any questions, any confusions, any concerns. Um, and at that meeting, I do go over this process with uh, the lead and the team. So the process uh, is we're going to be looking at three courses in this throughout this process. So uh, course number one, of course, comes first. Uh, so when you identify course number one, um, every reviewer will be looking at course number one using the CVC OEI rubric. Uh, so every reviewer will look at that course. Um, you guys, every everyone uh, gives you know the different um, you know is it aligned? Is it is it not complete? Is it exemplary? Uh, once that done, what that once that is done, we all meet for a local norming session. Uh, so I'm in that session as well as as many people in your team can be. Uh, we're looking at the results of that review and we go through a norming process just with your team. Um, so we go through the different areas. We talk about where there's discrepancies and you know what each member of the team found. Um, so that this first local norming session tends to go a little bit longer because there is a lot of discussion. Then um, I ask your team to compile that information, that feedback, and give it back to the the course author, the faculty member, because they do have to align that course. That course does need to be aligned. Um, while that work is happening, though, we can move on to course number two. Uh, and course number two is identified by your team. Um, the review happens as well, but in this case, it's happening in pairs. So the lead will, you guys will pair each other up however you seem you, you see fit, you'll go through the review. The goal is for the pairs to talk and um, talk about um, talk about how uh, how they norm how they score the course if it's you know aligned, not aligned, exemplary, all of that. Um, all of that information again is compiled. We have a second norming session. Um, this one tends to go a little bit faster. Uh, but there's still that discussion. We talk about any discrepancies. Um, then you compile that um, review and give that course author the feedback and have them align the course. Um, as that alignment is occurring, we can move on to course number three that your team has identified. And in course number three, we are asking for your team to review the course the way that they normally would. So whatever your process is, typically it's two people looking at the course, a minimum of two people looking at the course. You follow that process. Um, we do meet for a final norming session. And then there is that uh, feedback given to that course author. Um, so we have a total of three norming sessions. Then we wait for the three courses to be aligned once the three courses are aligned, then you get your uh, local poker certification. And um, then you're able, we'll, those three courses will get the QR badge because they have been aligned. And then moving forward, you can continue with your local poker process and continue to align your courses. Um, so that's the process in a nut nutshell. And then, you know, you, you keep coming to these norming sessions. Um, you know, keep keep up with, you know, anything new that's happening or just reviewing uh, what's going on with the rubric. Um, so I'll look through the chat very quickly, but if anybody has any questions, uh, please feel free to raise your hand. I don't see any questions. I do see some, uh, some, but they've been answered. All right, so I think we're good with that. Excellent, okay. So moving on. So I hope that made sense. I hope uh, that was, uh, I clarified uh, enough and it's not too confusing, but if you do have questions, if you do want to meet one on one, I'm happy to meet with you. So you can always uh, get a hold of me. Okay, so um, we still have 
19 minutes left, but I do have quite a few reminders and I have a few more links to drop in the chat for you to complete. Um, so I'll go, to go ahead and get on with that. Um, so a few reminders before we leave. Um, we do have poker courses available uh, this fall. An email was sent to the poker leads um, with the registration dates and the links for uh, the courses. Um, if you are not a lead, please reach out to your lead and they can share that information with you. If you are a lead and you can't find that email, please email me and I'll send it to you. I've been forwarded, forwarding it to uh, a few leads um, so that you can have that information. Um, and as uh, Dr. Ramini said, we will have uh, new offerings for spring, which you will receive. Uh, all the leads will receive an email with that information. And just know that those um, poker courses, dates, and registration links, they're always sent to the leads. Uh, we don't send them to the reviewers. We send them to the leads so that the leads can distribute them accordingly in their college. Uh, there have been times where I do receive emails from um, people at the college reviewers wanting the, um, the links, and I always tell them who their lead is, and I have them contact their lead, uh, because I don't want to share those links just with anyone, uh, because, you know, you have your own process in your college, and, you know, you know who should be taking those po poker courses, so I just want to make that clarification. Um, our poker, our, our poker course was revised uh, about a year ago, more or less, maybe a little bit less than a year ago. Um, the revised version now includes section D. So poker, the poker course is now six weeks long. Um, if you completed the course a little while ago, the version that you completed did not include section D. Um, it was only four weeks long. Um, so there is a poker addendum that only focuses on section D. This uh, is available to anyone that completed that four week poker course. Um, we are in, we have been encouraging everyone um, to complete that poker course addendum. It's a self paced course. Uh, there is one activity that is graded. Once you complete um, that activity, it will be graded and you will receive a badge. And I'm gonna go ahead and drop the link for that um, addendum course in the chat. Let me see. Um, so in case you need it, you can share it with uh, your other reviewers, um, but that's the link that will get you to the registration of that section D, that's just the addendum course. Again, it's self-paced um, and uh, it's still available. Um, all right. Um, oh, and if you were already registered for that uh, addendum D course and you haven't completed it, I do encourage you to go back in and complete it uh, because we do have a lot of people registered that didn't complete it. I do encourage you to go back in and complete it as soon as you're able to complete it. Um, all right. And I'm going to drop the sign-in sheet, sheet one more time, one last time into the chat. Uh, make sure that you're signed, that you've signed in. Um, as I said earlier, um, if you are a local poker certified, we do encourage uh, you to attend two of these norming sessions. Um, all right. Uh, so lastly, uh, in the reminders, I want to put out a call. Oh, I have Heather has a question. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, just real quick before you move on. Um, some of our reviewers who were doing the addendum for Section D, when they submitted their final assignment, they got a message that said that it was no longer being monitored or graded. Um, so I told them to complete it anyway and just send me a screenshot. But is that being monitored now? Was that just a short term issue during the yeah. transition? Okay. So it was, so it, it is being monitored again. I'll okay. make sure to go back in and check and see if, you know, uh, if there's anything that needs to be graded. Um, but if there's anyone that you know that completed it that didn't receive the badge, please send me an email. And if you can give me their names, that would be great. Uh, because sometimes I get emails saying like, oh, can you like just the people from my college? <laughs> Like that's a long list I have to go through. Um, so if I can get names, that makes it a lot easier for me. Perfect. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. 
All right. Um, so lastly, I do want to put a call out, call out for any college that has included an equity uh, equity into their poker process, into their review. Um, as you all know, our course design rubric currently does not include an equ equity uh, portion. And at this time, there are no plans to add this, but I would like us to dedicate some time in our upcoming statewide norming sessions to share ideas of how this can be added. And in some cases is already being has already been added to the poker process. So if you have something in place at your college, please reach out to me. Um, I would love you to possibly present at our next White State Norming session. So I do want to start adding uh, like an equity section that we can just kind of talk about and brainstorm and get ideas uh, so that we can start thinking about that, in, you know, to hopefully implement into our own colleges. Um, and I do have one more link for everyone. I did create a short uh, survey and I'm hoping that you guys can all access this. Um, oh, Angela, yes, uh, Angela saying, I, and this is equity. I think there's a way to fold it into our rubric as it stands given our data. It's clear that the rubric already has an impact. Totally agree with that. Um, so that's something that uh, we can definitely talk about and look into. And then we have the Peralta rubric. Yes, definitely. Um, so I did drop one final link into the chat. That's a survey um, about this session. I would love to get your feedback. If you can just take a few moments. I made it super short um, just to um, get some ideas and get your feedback because I you know, these norming sessions are for all of us. So I want to make sure that the information being provided is pertinent to all of us. Um, Jessica. Yeah, so she, the survey says that we need permission. We're putting it in the chat, but I don't know if you saw that. Oh, okay. Thank you. Let me see. I'll scroll up. Oh, no, the survey says you need permission. Oh, okay. Let me see if I can do something really fast. I guess I should find it myself. Oh, let me see. I'm trying. Um, okay, I need to go here. Oh, that's the one thing that I didn't test out. I mean, I shared it with people. We looked at it, but that was it. That's all we did. So I may have to send that to you guys. Um, I may have to send that to you guys later because I don't want to. I don't want to keep you guys waiting. Uh, let's see. I may, I'll just. So Chi Martin put uh, something in the chat. It just has to be changed so that oh. access is available outside of the organization, uh, like the other okay, document. Okay, okay. We've got Anyone this. with the link. Anyone with the link. I got it. Done. All right. Should we try it again? Let's see. I'll drop it in again. So I changed the permission. Did it work? Still not working. Oh, okay. Well, I, guess. I think I'm giving up for now. Yeah. Anyone with the link? Oh, can view, can view. No, but I, I don't want you guys to edit it. So to just share the link with me very briefly on editor access, I think I can get it fixed. I can in. access it now. You can access it now, Marty? Yep. All right. Looks like we got it fixed. Oh, okay. All right, Brendan. Well, it says I, I need permission. Hmm. Says that. I think only CVC people can access it. Hmm. Mine still says permission too. Okay, so it's not working. Brandon, I gave you editor access restricted. Only people with access can open the link. Anyone with the link, I say done. Okay, can you guys try it one more time? <laughs> there it is. Sorry, so she's not working for me. Okay. Then I will have to email you guys. I'll email you all with it. Uh, the leads at least with it. Um, darn it. Okay, I, I had some fabulous questions in there, um, but 
um, thank you, Dr. Amina says that they will, that it will be sent via email. All right. So I don't want to keep you all waiting longer. I know I still have nine minutes, but um, I want to thank everyone for attending. And I will send that survey out because I do want to know. Um, I want to get your feedback. As I said, these Norman sessions are for all of us. And I want to make sure that they uh, are on topics that you all need, that we all need, um, so that we can continue to do all the work that we're doing. Our next session is December 13th, 2023, 10 to 12. There is my uh, contact, my email, anything poker. Uh, shoot me an email and I'll be happy to um, help you all. Thank you so much for those of you who presented. Angela, Heather, Donna, thank you, thank you, thank you for taking the time for answering my email. Um, I wish you all a very, very happy Thursday, almost Friday. Um, once again, thank you so much for being here.